Okay, good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the portfolio on this occasion is net zero energy and transport. I'd ask members wishing to ask a supplementary uh, question to press their uh, request to speak buttons during the relevant uh, question. I'd also make a plea, given the level of interest in supplementaries uh, today, for the questions to be as brief as possible and the answers to match. Question number one has not been lodged. Question number two, Graham Day. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans forestry and land Scotland has for the Glen Prosen estate. Minister Manny McCallum. Um, Presiding Officer, Glen Prosen estate. Oh, microphone, please. Can we have the Minister's mic, please? Yeah, I've done that. That might be it. Thank you. Sorry. Um, Presiding Officer, Prosen Estate will be managed by Forestry and Land Scotland in accordance with a variety of Scottish Government policy aims to benefit people, nature and climate and the local economy. By collaborating with the community and neighbouring public and private landowners and managers, FLS and the wider Scottish Government is keen to lead a partnership approach to land management and habitat restoration on a landscape scale, and that across the Angus Glens and within the Cairngorms National Park. Graham Day. I uh, thank the Minister for the answer, but more importantly, I want to thank Forestry and Land Scotland for their engagement with myself as the local MSP <coughs> over the purchase of the estate and the implication for employees, two of whom secured housing tenancies as a result of those discussions, which also helped lead to a part-time employment opportunity for an estate staff member. However, it is only by expanding that type of engagement into the wider community that we will hopefully avoid ill-informed commentary of the type which surrounded the sale process. So can I ask the Minister to assure me that going forward FLS will engage fully with the local community around the plans for the estate and with neighbouring land holdings in relation to deer management? Minister. Um, Presiding officer, I am glad to assure Mr Day that um, FLS will be actively engaging with all local stakeholders. I am very pleased to hear they have already been engaging with him as constituency MSP. This will include uh, especially the local community, neighbouring landowners, as I said. And all of this will form part of the land management plan, which FLS will develop over the coming year, to ensure that the benefits of this acquisition can be um, uh, afforded uh, by everyone. And I would add that as well as the uh, arrangements for employment of those who worked on the former sporting estate, um, as well as an opportunity for landscape scale restoration, this acquisition presents the opportunity for community uh, engagement and opportunity, something that was limited in the former use. And I think we can expect employment opportunities from woodland creation, among other pursuits. Thank you. And briefly, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The purchase of Glen Prosen Estate is one of the largest land deals involving settled land for years. But despite the warm words that we've just heard about future consultation, the £18 million pr purchase was entirely off market, behind closed doors, and with no meetings or consultations with any of the local community. So, Minister, given the recent public and media attention about so-called green lairds, does the Minister consider that this purchase process was appropriate as to how deals of public interest are conducted? And can we expect similar secrecy in future public land Minister. purchases? Presiding officer, FLS, they operate in a competitive commercial land market where their job is to work to optimise benefits for the people of Scotland. Uh, FLS were one of a small number of potentially interested parties who were approached by the agents to bid on that, um, and given the enormous strategic opportunity presented by the, the former sporting estate for Scottish Government objectives, uh, FLS opted to offer. Um, now, I have already rehearsed some of the multiple benefits that will come from this landscape scale woodland um, Recreation is, a, a creation is, a, is an opportunity, so is peatland restoration and community involvement. And as Liam Kerr takes the opportunity to say on the record what the actual sale price was, I hope that him and his colleagues will consider some of the more spurious figures that they have used in this chamber before, which I was not able correct to correct owing to confidentiality, and I will leave it to them to consider their uh, responsibilities for correcting the record. And question number three, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will have carried out an assessment of the potential impact of its decision to end the Network Support Grant Plus for bus operators. Minister Jenny Gordon. It is clear that the current cost of living crisis is making it challenging to deliver bus services in many local communities. That is why the temporary network support grant plus has been extended until the 31st of March this year to help people afford to travel this winter. I continue to collaborate with bus operators through the bus task force to address the immediate challenges to help bus operators move to a more sustainable footing and to ensure the sector is supported by wider policies to improve bus services across Scotland. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for the answer. 
after the SNP Green Government decided to cut the Network Support Grant Plus on the 9th of October, they then quickly U-turned and reintroduced the scheme in December 2022. However, the scheme has now only been brought back until March and the funding has been reduced by 22% for bus operators. So can the Minister confirm the reasons for ending this scheme again and why the funding offered has been significantly reduced? Minister. I'm not sure if Mr Alex, uh, if Alexander Stewart rather, is aware that the NSG Plus grant was always a temporary fund. It was always meant to come to an end at the end of the pandemic. I actually have made two decisions now to extend that funding further, one back in June and one, as the member alluded to, in October. And the funding coming to an end in March brings us into line, actually, with the funding ending in England and in Wales. Um, so there is uh, parity now across the UK in terms of that emergency funding that was, of course, announced during the pandemic to help uh, our bus operators uh, survive and also to sustain themselves further as we continue to support that recovery from the pandemic. I think it's really important to uh, put on the record the additional funding that we provide to bus operators. So that's around £210 million pounds that we've already given during the pandemic. And that, of course, has ensured our bus operators are well positioned and are at the forefront of that green recovery. We also need to tackle, of course, congestion and improve bus journey times. We've also awarded £25 million pounds of initial funding for this to 11 bus partnerships covering 28 local authorities across Scotland. And looking uh, ahead, of course, we will consider any further support we may be able to provide the sector. But these are very challenging times for the government, as the member will recognise. And briefly, Mark Russell. Um, despite the huge investment in bus from the Scottish Government, from COVID recovery funding to extension of concessionary travel, many constituents of ours are still facing really poor services. I understand that the receipt of the Network Support Grant Plus is conditional on operators meeting particular terms and conditions from fee freezing fares to protecting service levels. So can I ask the Transport Minister to provide any further information on when, whether any current recipients of the fund have been penalised for not meeting the fund's conditions? As briefly as possible, Minister. I don't have the detail of uh, what the member has asked me, but I can confirm that a freeze on fares uh, is conditional on participating in the NSG Plus extension. I'd be happy to write to the member with the detail he has sought. Question four, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what economic analysis it considered prior to awarding ferry contracts worth £150 million to a shipyard in Turkey. Minister Jenny Gorlis. The long term economic benefits of this investment will be derived from the improvements to the Tarbot, Harris, and Lochmadi North East ferry services, over a 40% increase in vehicle capacity during summer and over 10% of an increase in winter, will support sustainable growth on our islands. These vessels will also provide significant reliability and resilience benefits across the wider West Coast routes. In line with relevant procurement legislation, the contract was awarded following an open tendering process by CMAL as procuring authority. The bid received from the yard represented best value for money in terms of quality and price. Paul Sweeney. Thank you. Um, well, the glaring omission in that answer was about the impact on the Scottish shipbuilding industry. And I'm afraid when I already asked a written question in regards to this about what weighting is applied to foreign shipbuilders against domestic shipbuilders, the Scottish Government told me that they score foreign domestic shipbuilders the same on social value and other criteria. So an apprenticeship created in Turkey is weighed the same as an apprenticeship created in Greenock. It's absurd given analysis shows that one pound spent on domestic shipbuilding returns a 35% benefit to local economy in Scotland. Scotland and supply chains. The Minister not realise how foolish this approach is and that she realised that continuing with that approach will result in the terminal decline of shipbuilding in Scotland, given most foreign shipbuilders are heavily subsidised by their governments and are therefore able to submit bids that domestic shipbuilders are similarly unable to compete with. Minister. The, the member touched on a, a number of different points in his question. I, I recognise he's also asked a number of written parliamentary questions, which I believe um, I have responded to. Um, I think in relation to the, the vessels themselves, of course, the relevant procurement legislation has been adhered to. And the most important uh, challenge to my mind at the current time is bringing that additional capacity to um, the Western Isles in particular and to the CalMAC that we have to provide additional capacity. I'm really proud actually that in the last year alone we've been able to confirm that there will be the two new additional Isla vessels. We have the additional vessel on the Open to Craig Muir route in the Loch Frisia. Um, I confirmed additional uh, vessels at the end of last year to which the member has alluded but the bid received from that yard represented the best value for money in terms of quality and price and the two vessels in construction at the yard are progressing 
guessing well that the two um, that I announced earlier this year and remain on time and within budget. Um, CMAL's recent confirmation of signing the, the contract with the additional two vessels at the same design spec with uh, the same yard follows the recent procurement exercise the member has alluded to, but that also includes a full builder's refund guarantee. But the most important uh, point, I think, in all of this is that we deliver that extra capacity to CalMAC to allow them to provide a more sustainable uh, service to the Western Isles in particular. I've got two brief supplementaries, but they will need to be brief as will the answers. First, Jenny, uh, Jenny Mint. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would remind Labour that it was the SNP who took action to save Ferguson's shipyard from closure. As the Minister has just highlighted, um, the, these new ferries are going to increase capacity and resilience for islanders. This investment is therefore welcome news for islanders and businesses. So does the Minister share my views that we should all, that we should all focus on the real differences that these vessels will make to the lives of the people who rely on them rather than seeking to score political points. Okay, as possible, I absolutely do. Ms Minto is right to highlight our intention for these vessels, uh, on these vessels and the benefits that they will bring to our island communities and businesses that they will serve. Uh, some of the challenges have been well rehearsed, presiding officer, in this chamber in recent months, so we should all welcome this investment from the Scottish Government. Now, if we look at the progress, as I mentioned, in the last 12 months, we have now four additional major vessels on order or under construction, in addition to the two major vessels under construction at Port Glasgow, and the Scottish Government remains absolutely committed to improving improving our lifeline very fleet and better meeting the needs of our island communities. And very briefly, Willie Rennie. I think there's on one occasion that the, the Minister shouldn't be proud, as she put it. It's in the case of constructing ferries uh, for the Western Isles. She should be ashamed of what's happened, not proud. Can I just ask a specific question? Were there any clauses in the contract with SEMRA stipulating that Scottish businesses should form part of the supply chain? Minister. Um, I think in relation to the procurement, which is the wider uh, point of Mr Rennie's question, I asked and answered that in relation to Mr Sweeney's point. Um, in relation to, to Ferguson's more generally, we know the Yard are actively pursuing opportunities for future vessel contracts. As a shareholder and as a government, we'll do all we can to help the Yard secure those opportunities. But decisions on what vessel contracts to bid for are, of course, a matter for the Yard management and the board themselves. Thank you. Question number five, Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government how the Strategic Transport Projects Review No. 2 will improve rail infrastructure, journey times and rail connectivity across the South Scotland region. Minister Jenny Coles. A number of the SDPR2 recommendations make a direct contribution to improving rail in the South of Scotland. These focus on infrastructure to provide access for all at railway stations, on decarbonising the network, on high-speed cross-border rail enhancements, on consideration of the upgrade or relocation of Stranraer rail station and on rail freight terminals and facilities. All of these will contribute to meeting the aims of protecting the climate and improving lives through better transport connectivity. Emma Harper. Thank the Minister for that answer. The STPR2 makes a commitment to improve journey times, specifically on the Glasgow Carlisle line. Can the Minister comment further on how this commitment will be taken forward and on timescales for the changes happening, as improving this line from the current two-hour journey from Dumfries to Glasgow will allow more people to rely on public transport across the region and will attract people to D&G, as the stations in the region could be key commuter lines to Glasgow? Minister. I very much agree with the sentiment of the member's question. Of course, the long-term plans for our rail network in Scotland, including the south of Scotland, are set out in the SDPR 2, which was published back in December 20. Uh, of last year, rather. The recommendations for future rail investment focus on the decarbonisation of the remainder of the network and on reducing uh, the emissions from road transport by getting more freight and passengers onto rail. SDPR 2 will help to deliver the vision, priorities and outcomes set out in the National Transport Strategy um, and it will also provide uh, improved rail infrastructure journey times, as the member alluded to, and rail connectivity across the south of Scotland. Now, the delivery plan, which will give the further detail that Ms Harper has sought today, will be published later this year, and I believe the Cabinet Secretary will be bringing a statement to Parliament uh, next week on this very matter. OK, a couple of supplementaries. First, Brian Whittle. Hey, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. So, after years of waiting, hundreds of thousands of pounds of public funds, the long-awaited STPR2 report still leaves us none the wiser as to what investment the Scottish Government will commit to the south of Scotland transport infrastructure. So now can, I, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, for the sake of all those who live in the South West, when can we expect any details on actual projects for this area of Scotland already ignored by the Scottish Government and bring the transport infrastructure up to an acceptable standard? As, possible, Minister. Uh, as I think I mentioned in my response to Ms Harper, the delivery plan will be set out in the coming months and the Cabinet Secretary will bring a statement to Parliament uh, next week. And Colin Smith. 
Thank you, President Officer. During the budget, the Deputy First Minister said a six-month pilot will remove peak rail time fares. It turns out it will only be some peak rail fares. So can the Minister tell us which rail routes in South Scotland will see peak fares removed? Because clearly it won't be all of them. And Minister. Um, my understanding is it will be all routes and the coming details. I await further uh, advice from my officials in Transport Scotland in relation to how the scheme will operate. Thank you. And question number six, uh, Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to help increase public transport use in East Kilbride. Minister Jenny Goldruth. The Scottish Government is investing over £100 million in the East Kilbride rail project, enabling more diesel trains to be replaced across Scotland and encouraging greater modal shift. The electrification from Glasgow to Barhead is underway alongside the relocation of Hermeyer Station, where the plan is to create a new fully accessible transport interchange, giving the local community the option to walk, wheel or travel by bus to the station. We are also supporting bus use through the under-22s free bus travel scheme, which means that around half of Scotland's population can now travel for free by bus. Colette Stevenson. I thank the Minister for that response. Could the Minister provide an update <coughs> on the East Kilbride rail enhancements, as well as the benefits the Clyde Metro will bring to the town, and can she outline the local engagement taking place on these matters? Minister. So for East Kilbride Network Rail, advance works have been undertaken at a number of locations, including the successful removal of a redundant footbridge last weekend at the site of the proposed new Hermeyer station. We continue to make good progress with the East Kilbride business case, including a very well-received event here in the Parliament for members late last year. As the project develops and the full programme of works is finalised, Network Rail will intensify their activities and continue to work closely with communities, MSPs and other stakeholders along the line of the route to keep them informed. Work on the Clyde Metro has been undertaken through the 2022 uh, scoping programme level business case. That is being undertaken collaboratively, led by Transport Scotland and its partners, Glasgow City Council and Strathclyde Partnership for Transport. A delivery plan will be uh, prepared following the completion of the programme level business case. An engagement will be obviously key to that business case as it progresses. And a couple of brief supplementaries. First, Graham Simpson. Thank you very much. I, th I think what people of uh, East Kilbride want to know, and I certainly want to know, and I'm sure Colette Stevenson wants to know, is when work is actually going to start on the East Kilbride line and when it will be complete. Minister. Um, I alluded in my response to uh, Ms Stevenson to the ongoing engagement with Network Rail. And I think it's really important that Mr Simpson, of course, as a local MSP, continues that engagement too. I think he met with Network Rail very recently on the project itself. Um, in terms of the, the timescales uh, in relation to the de decarbonisation work itself, I'm more than happy to write to the member with an update on those uh, if they've changed in any way, shape or form in the, the last months, but not to my knowledge. And Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. In a previous uh, portfolio question time, the Minister gave a commitment to ask Transport Scotland officials to compile data on the number of bus service cancellations and the reasons for these cancellations. Can the Minister update us on that matter and tell us if and when the Government expects to know the full extent of bus service cancellations in Scotland? Minister. I did commit to uh, ask my officials in Transport Scotland to provide that data. I have not yet received that data from my officials, but I am more than happy to publish it as and when I receive it to give that national picture of cancellations, because I very much recognise, as the member has alluded to, the ongoing challenges we face in that respect. Question number seven, Ruth Maguire. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address fuel poverty in North Ayrshire. Cabinet Secretary. We are tackling fuel poverty throughout Scotland with £119 million allocated this year to provide heat energy efficiency and fuel poverty measures for, to fuel poor households. This includes uh, funding for our area-based scheme delivered in partnership with local authorities. Uh, since uh, 2013, North Ayrshire Council has received over £13.2 million in ABS funding, enabling energy efficiency upgrades to be made to over 2,700 homes. This year, the Council has been awarded £1.8 million to target homes in five fuel poor areas for installation of uh, external wall insulation and also uh, to help to support 100 fuel poor homes receive solar PV systems. Ms Maguire. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I have constituents in housing association properties which require work to make them more energy efficient. The landlord tells me that they have no funds for capital improvements. My constituents' wages are stagnant and all other bills are going up, including rent year on year, 7% this year. 
Um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what guidance he can give as to what funding is available, whether that is grants or loans to housing associations for such work, and further, what advice the Scottish Government can give to help support my constituents in housing association homes? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, the uh, schemes which uh, apply to housing associations are exactly the area-based schemes that I just made reference to, and for housing associations who are looking to undertake energy efficiency pro programmes, they should be looking to engage with Warmer Homes Scotland in the range of funding which is available to them to support the installation, uh, the installation of uh, energy efficiency measures in properties. Thank you. Question number eight, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the final design for the duelling of the A9 Perth to Inverness road between the Pass of Burnham and the Tay Crossing will be published. Cabinet Secretary. The design work for this challenging section of the A9 is continuing following a community creative process. This process has helped us form an extremely positive working relationship with the local community and broaden the vision for duelling this section of the A9. An announcement on the preferred route option is expected to be made in the coming months, after which the preferred option will be further refined, developed and assessed before commencement of the statutory process. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response? The community in Dunkeld and Burnham, and indeed other road users of the A9, have now been waiting eight years to see a finalised design uh, for this section. Uh, I know there has been extensive engagement with the local community, but that ceased many, mon many months ago, uh, and we still have not seen a finalised plan that we were expecting by the end of last year. So, can the Minister be more specific as to when exactly we will see a finalised design? being published, and perhaps more importantly, when can we expect the works to be done on completing the dual carriageway in this section? Cabinet Secretary. Observe, officer, the member will recognise that having gone through a co-creative co process with the local community who have uh, identified a preferred route option that they would uh, choose, we have to compare that against other potential route options, of which there are three others uh, alongside that which is being considered by or supported by the local community. Uh, that piece of work and that assessment work is ongoing at the present time. Once it has been completed by officials, we should then be in a position to set out our preferred route option. And as I mentioned in my response, it will then be, uh, we will then communicate that, and I hope to be able to do that in the coming months. Uh, the final aspect in relation to the procurement process, that will have to, we'll have to go through the orders process, first of all, before that piece of work can be undertaken, uh, which is obviously a statutory process. And once that has been completed, we will then look at the procurement process for this particular aspect of the A9. And supplementary, Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, even now, the Transport Scotland website says that duelling of the A9 between Perth and Inverness will be completed by 2025. If that happens, Presiding officer, I will go out and purchase a hat in order to be able to eat it. <laughs> Seriously, do we not owe an apology to the people of the Highlands and Scotland? Because we will not achieve that target. Should we not come clean? And above all, Cabinet Secretary, when will we bring forward full details, a fresh timetable, and full details of how we will implement one of our longest standing pledges we have ever made? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, I, I recognise Mr Ewan's long standing interest in this and want to reassure him of the Government's uh, long standing and ongoing commitment to the duelling of the A9. There are a number of factors which are being taken into account at the present moment in terms of the procurement process for the next section which we were looking to do, which has been impacted by COVID and has also been quite significantly impacted by the very significant levels of construction inflation which is now being experienced. And we're also having to now look at, in particular, because of some of the economic challenges we have, the potential procurement approach that we take forward in procuring this particular aspect. So we are uh, looking at taking forward further procurement in the uh, months ahead. And I can assure him that we're also looking at the forward timetable for the programme as we go forward in the years ahead. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, that concludes portfolio questions. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next uh, item of business to allow the front benches to change.